How is it that music can evoke passion and so delicately hold sway over our moods and even thoughts? Aristotle reportedly said, music directly imitates the passions or states of the soul. Hence, when one listens to music that imitates certain passion, he becomes imbued with the same passion. In short, if one listens to the wrong kind of music, he will become the wrong kind of person. But conversely, if he listens to the right kind of music, he'll tend to become the right kind of person. When is music just great and passionate and a song that speaks to the soul? And when is music being used to manipulate, to manage, to market, and to get everyone in line? It seems that good music just grips you and makes you want to listen to it, and I've always wondered why. It is perhaps no surprise that music can alter mood and emotion, even to the point of mind control. An article in 2012 from the Scientific American, a mainstream publication with general establishment credentials, published The Power of Music Mind Control by Rhythmic Sound. It reads, you walk into a bar and music is thumping, all heads are bobbing, feet tapping in synchrony. Somehow the rhythmic sound grabs control of the brains of everyone in the room, forcing them to operate simultaneously and perform the same behaviors in synchrony. How is this possible? Is this unconscious mind control by rhythmic sound only driving our bodily motions? Or could it be affecting deeper mental processes? The mystery runs deeper than previously thought. According to psychologist Arnett Schrimmer, rhythmic sound not only coordinates the behavior of people in a group, it also coordinates their thinking. The mental processes of individuals in the group become synchronized. This finding extends to the well-known power of music to tap into brain circuits, controlling emotion and movement to actually control brain circuitry of sensory perception. And this discovery explains how drums unite tribes in ceremony, why armies march to bugle and drum in battle, why worship and ceremonies are infused with song, why speech is rhythmic, punctuated by rhythms of emphasis on particular syllables and words, and perhaps why we dance. And they described a study where they had subjects look at a monitor and they flashed images and they were supposed to call out the ones that were upside down. And while they were doing this, they had a simple four beat rhythm playing in the background. It was syncopated and skipped the fourth beat of every measure. And what they found was that the subjects much more quickly identified this inverted image when it was shown in the missing drum beat of the four beat rhythm. especially compared with when they showed the image randomly or out of sync with the beat, and even on the beat itself because the anticipation of the skip beat, the conditioning to expect that to happen, caused the brain itself to pay more attention during that part of the rhythm. It was a rhythm of heightened expectation and they found that the mind trying to call out these images had superior performance on the anticipated beat. And they found that the EEG recordings showed the waves of brain activity, both alpha and beta waves, became synchronized around the auditory rhythm. Perception of the external world entering our mind through our eyes is affected by the rhythm of what we hear in beat with an auditory rhythm. It's not some kind of long drawn out meditation or hypnotic effect. It happens as soon as the brain interacts with music. And it reminded me of a Kurt Vonnegut sci-fi novel published back in 1959, The Sirens of Titan, where he painted an eerie vision of one possible future in which men were so hopelessly debased as to be commanded on Mars of all places by radio-controlled rhythms and behavior modification through punitive shocks. And the passage talks about how the men had marched to the parade ground to the sound of a snare drum. The snare drum had this to say to them. Rent a tent, a tent, a tent. Rent a tent, a tent, a tent. Rent a tent, rent a tent. Rent a rent a rent a tent. The army had come to attention in utter silence. No audible or visible signal had been given. They'd come to attention as a man, as though through a stupendous coincidence. An observer would have been at loss as to who was really in charge, since even the generals moved like marionettes, 
keeping time to the idiotic words, rented a tent, a tent, a tent, rented a tent, a tent, a tent. And so you can see the rhythm itself is driving and reinforcing the behavior. And Sirens of Titan goes on to talk about the character in this chapter. It says, Ankh, a soldier, had just come out of the base hospital where he had been treated for mental illness, and Unk's mind was almost a blank. At the hospital, they told him what his sergeant's name was, what a sergeant was at all. They even had to explain to Unk that there was a radio antenna under the crown of his skull, and that it would hurt him whenever he did something a good soldier would never do. The antenna would also give him orders, and furnish drum music to march to. They said that not just Unk, but everybody had an antenna like that. Doctors and nurses and even four-star generals included. They gave Unk a small sample of the pain his antenna would stick him with if he ever did anything wrong. Back on Earth, things aren't quite that bad, at least not yet, but the possibilities are staggering. A separate article in Scientific American also explored the tonal effects of music on how we think, and this is a much more general area, but they figured out definite specific moods just from the arrangement of the music itself. It has something to do with the degree of harmony that is perceived by the brain. For example, the difference between a perfect fifth and the transition of music notes according to the Pythagorean tradition as compared with, say, a very discordant or disharmonious, but sometimes more intriguing minor scale. But again, that's all music theory stuff that I don't really fully understand. Nevertheless, it was the ancient Greece figure Pythagoras, better known for his mathematical theorems and geometry, who identified the major musical scales based on identifying the mathematical principle behind harmonics and the length of a vibrating string. Pythagoras considered music to be number and time. He reportedly said, Number is the ruler of forms and ideas and the cause of gods and demons. And he reportedly went around performing, quote, soul adjustments using his music as a tool of correction. There are numerous accounts of Pythagoras using music as a tool of intervention to calm enraged swordsmen, crossed lovers ready to kill their rivals, and drunken pyromaniacs determined to burn down the homes of women who rejected their advances. In each case, a stirring Phrygian mode of music was found playing at the scene, and Pythagoras arranged to switch the music to a slow and dirge-like spondaic mode, proving the rhythm had the power to calm them usually instantaneously. This book, Sacred Sounds, Transformation Through Music and Word, says the seven-string lyre is a symbol of the mysticism of the universe. Each string is related to a mood of humanity, to a subtle body, to one of the seven major planets, and to one of the seven planes of life. Each string has reflected within it an aspect of the human soul and the laws of science and art. The lyre has been associated with many ancient masters and myths. Students of Pythagoras were trained in its use. They used it on people who had illnesses, and they restored balance with these tones. In the Bible in the Old Testament in 1 Samuel 16, a story is told about how King David got recruited to play for King Saul, who apparently had a demon spirit in him, and he used the lyre to rid the demon. He was advised to seek out a man who's a wise player on a harp, and it shall come to pass, and then he shall play with his hand, and thou shalt be well. It says David took a harp and played with his hand, and Saul was refreshed and well, and the evil spirit departed from him. So these were sacred notes on a lyre on a harp, and the way they were tuned and the way they were played had supernatural effects, the power to heal, uh, to cast away demons, to, to please the Lord. As the Leonard Cohen song says, I've heard there was a secret chord that David played, and it pleased the Lord, but you don't really care for music, do you? It goes like this, the fourth, the fifth, the minor fall, the major lift. Well, the Scientific American article from 2014 discusses how music changes the way you think and encourages literally different frames of mind. And it starts out basically talking about the arrangement of music and the particular scales that are used. Hum the first two notes of the Simpsons theme song. If you're not a Simpsons fan, then Maria from West Side Story will also do. The music interval you're hearing, the pitch gap between the notes, is known as a tritone, and it's commonly recognized in music theory 
is one of the most dissonant intervals, so much so that composers and theorists in the 18th century dubbed it Diabolus in Musica, Devil in Music. Now hum the first few notes of Twinkle Twinkle Little Star, or if you prefer, something with a little more street cred, the I'm sorry part in Outcast Miss Jackson. This is the perfect fifth. It's one of the most consonant intervals used in myriad compositions as a vehicle of resolution and harmony. Is it possible that hearing such isolated musical components could change the way you think? And they go on to describe a study that suggests that indeed it could very much change the way you think. The specific thing they found in the study was what they say is a relatively new theory known as construal level theory. And it is the premise of the link between how far things are from people and how abstractly they construe them. The example being a Hawaiian vacation that's in the future and the distance a year away is general. There's basic features. There'll be beach. There'll be a sun. But when it's right upon you, just days away, you've you've got a pack. There's a detailed list. There's specific things. There's the weather forecast and whatever. Uh, A different type of attention in the mind. And the forest, in other words, becomes the trees, they say but they found that the chord patterns themselves are highly specific to this kind of process because the music's ability to conjure up highly specific mental states is apparent. Tiny, almost immeasurable features in a piece of music have the power to elicit deeply personal and specific patterns of thought and emotion in human listeners. Unfamiliar tonalities, the proverbial auditory forest, cause people to construe things abstractly. But, by contrast, the rapid, consonant, familiar chords of the perfect fifth, the auditory trees, bring out the concrete mindset. Joaquin Hansom and Johann Melsner in the Journal of Experimental Social Psychology played them a short, stripped-down piece of music consisting of a series of alternating chords. Some people heard chords including the tritone, others heard the perfect fifth. They asked them to take a list of shopping items and organize them into groups. You know, they would see whether they thought of detergent and paper towels as the same category. But the tritone people formed fewer categories than the perfect fifth people, indicating they were thinking broadly and more inclusively. People who were exposed to the tritone type of music samples were more likely to be swayed by aggregated information, a five-star must-have. But the people who heard the fifth, the very harmonious note, had the reverse reaction. They were more likely to be swayed by an individual review. So, kind of interesting. And this book, The Sacred Sounds, Transformation Through Music and Word, it has a list of responses to musical harmonies that have been figured out over the years. And a lot of these meanings are also symbolic. They've even been used ritualistically, magically. And they talk about how the perfect octave, I think basically the middle C, it has a feeling of rest. There's a union between the male and the female sides. The fifth, which is a G and a C, stimulates feelings of movement and power of new life coming forth, a specific sense of rebirth, whereas the third, which has an E and a C, awakens compatibility and resonance, and it has a, quote, magical quality to storytelling and embellishment, whatever that means. The fourth has an F and a C, and it announces something new. It specifically hints at an entrance. It awakens feelings of being controlled. It touches at the heart and rings it, but it can make some people feel uneasy. The seventh, which has a B and a C, awakens feelings of distance and the need to resolve things. It creates anticipation and drama and the need for direction. And there's also the minor third with an E flat to a C. It specifically carries sadness and depression and a a vagueness of direction and disharmony and so forth and so on. These modes were all worked out back in the Greece days back with Pythagoras and then many of them were picked up again by the church but several of them were not used very often because either they had a taboo quality to them or they were only appropriate for very specific purposes and so a lot of stuff ended up just coming out in the basic major and minor key 
and a lot of these other modes were forgotten over the past couple hundred years up until the rise of rock music in the 50s, 60s, 70s, and so forth. That a lot of particular movements were underway during this time period. To use the music scene as a radical reshaper of the youth culture, to have people reveling in freedom and individuality, but to also have them behaving in ways that are both predictable and useful to the powers that be who incredibly turned loose on a whole generation not only copious amounts of mind-altering drugs that had just been tested by the government under secret human experimentation but also modes of music which had been established thousands of years ago but were rarely used whose particular arrangements were known to stir up things like ecstasy lust and beastly behavior uh, i guess the music in the background i wasn't even conscious of the music but i could actually hear the crowd and uh, it gave me a big uh big feeling inside you know? anger and violence could be aroused by the music or alternately calm down and one mode in particular is so disharmonious that it has long been believed to be of the devil distortions of perception and thinking that's it's kind of melting together you know melting together and then coming apart and vibrating but it's all moving. That's what's incredible. At its core, music consists of the interplay of melody, harmony, rhythm, the beat, and so the particular notes matter. Anyway, I heard about these seven different modes, and I did a lot of looking up until I found uh, some information that kind of correlated each of them. And it's very interesting, the kind of musical manipulation, the kind of messages that were being sent to the youth throughout this time period, when you think about a lot of the bands that were involved in using very particular types of music. And of course, after a while, it just spread everywhere, and it's not necessarily bad. It depends on how it's used. Uh, this is just the way that, that it is. So the first is the Lydian mode. It's a major key, major with raised fourth. And it's known for being fast, frenetic, energetic, woken, attention-getting, and perhaps a bit agitating. It's associated with mourning and the rising up in the morning, as well as with the Mars magical energy. And the scale's based on all white keys, F, G, A, B, C, D, E, F. And this includes music like the Simpsons theme, the Jetsons themes, very rising and upbeat straight from the beginning, Dreams by Fleetwood Mac, Free Will by Rush, Jane Says by Jane's Addiction, Hog Heaven by Frank Zappa, Here Comes My Girl by Tom Petty, Tonight, Tonight by The Smashing Pumpkins, and plenty of other songs, just a few examples. And so this mode was only used in certain instances. What was used much more widely was the standard mode, known as Ionian, and this is the major key, it's a standard major, and it's the basic C scale. It starts with middle C. C, D, E, F, G, A, B, C. This is your basic Do, Re, Mi, Fa, So, La, Ti, Do. And it has attributes of being very harmonious, of promoting health and friendship, and it's associated with the middle of the day time and the sun's magical and symbolic energy. And some of the staples of this kind of music are Ode to Joy by Beethoven, Let It Be by The Beatles, Jesus Joy of Man's Desiring, uh, some pieces by Bach, pop songs like Brown Eyed Girl by Van Morrison, Beast of Burden by The Rolling Stones, Like a Rolling Stone by Bob Dylan, Call Me Al, Paul Simon, Free Fall and Tom Petty, and others. So for a long time, that was the kind of music that everything was based on. But then in the explosion of counterculture, you also had these other modes coming out of the woodworks, being revived. And since they have a particular determination on behavior, emotion, attitude, you've got to ask yourself why they were brought out at a particular time and why certain bands use them a lot. A good example of that is the Mixolydian mode, which is also considered a major key. And in ancient Greek terms, this was the Dionysus mode. It was known for inducing ecstasy in listeners and associated with an afternoon Jupiter magical slash symbolic energy. And this is also just on the white keys, starting with G. G-A-B-C-D-E-F-G. 
And this is found in songs like L.A. Woman by The Doors, Norwegian Wood by The Beatles, Ramblin' Man by Allman Brothers, and it's known as Jerry Garcia's Signature Mode. And in particular, it's found in Grateful Dead songs like Dark Star and Fire on the Mountain. It's also in more recent music, The Pixies, Here Comes Your Man, Jimi Hendrix, Third Stone from the Sun, Blind Melon, No Rain, Neil Young, Cinnamon Girl, The Toadies Possible, Kingdom and Beatles songs Dear Prudence, Get Back, and Paperback Writer. So it's used a lot and it's not always just one scale per song. I mean usually there's a change up like an LA woman where they shift out of Mixolydian mode for the kind of end of the song part with Mr. Mojo rising and then it goes back into that mode. So there's a shift but when they do it there's a particular emotion that is brought out by that. Uh, another big one that was brought out particularly in the counterculture of the 60s and 70s was a much heavier use of Dorian mode, which is a minor key, and it's very old-timey. In the old days, it was very common. It was folksy, it's often haunting, and it's associated with evening and Saturn symbolic magical energy. And this is a scale that starts with D, E, F, G, A, B, C, D. Starts with D. Some people consider this to be very Pink Floyd-esque. It's also found in The Doors, The End, the very long, drawn-out, haunting song. Uh, Riders on the Storm, another Doors song. Another Brick in the Wall, Part 2 by Pink Floyd. Scarborough Fair by Simon and Garfunkel. And more recently, Wicked Game by Chris Isaac. Also, Horse With No Name by America, and Mad World, It's a Mad World, and on and on. There's also Aeolian Mode, it's a minor scale, very much associated with soulful, passionate, appeals to the gods, to meditation, calming, soothing, healing, and every way associated with midnight and moon, magic and symbolic energy. Uh, the scale starts with A, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, A. And this is identified in songs like Stairway to Heaven by Led Zeppelin, Achilles' Last Stand, also by Led Zeppelin, Black Magic Woman by Santana, All Along the Watchtower by Jimi Hendrix or Bob Dylan, take your pick, R.E.M.'s Losing My Religion, Fleetwood Mac's Rhiannon, Metallica's Nothing Else Matters, Black Sabbath's Paranoid, Sweet Dreams, The Eurythmics, or the Marilyn Manson version, Sarah McLachlan, Building a Mystery, so the stuff is still in use. Uh, one of the more suppressed modes, again until the recent explosion of music, is Phrygian mode. This one's associated with the pre-dawn and Venus energy, and it's considered sensual and sultry. Uh, it's associated with Latin, Gypsy, and Flamenco sounds, and it's very sad and lamenting. It evokes uh, lost love, and it also raises passions and sexual energy. So that's a very powerful type. It starts with E, E, F, G, A, B, C, D, E. This is found in Hallmark songs like Jefferson Airplane's White Rabbit, The Pyramid Song by Radiohead, Surfer Girl by The Beach Boys, the Doctor Who theme song, the song Hoodoo by Muse, especially the intro, Pink Floyd set the controls for the heart of the sun, Philip Glass's composition Satya Graha. Finally, there's the Locrian mode, which was pretty much banned and suppressed throughout uh, because it's known for being very dissonant, very discordant. And the dissonant tritone, known as a diminished fifth, very much is a controversial kind of music. It's considered that it doesn't stand on its own at all. It's very rarely used in an entire piece, but when it is used, it brings about an accent of disharmony. And it's associated uh, very much in a morning star kind of way with twilight, the time between night and day, and with mercury, magical, symbolic energy. The scale starts with a B, B, C, D, E, F, G, A, B. And in medieval times, this was the one that was thought to be of the devil, associated with witchcraft, said to be used to create portals. It's really very rarely used, but there's been a few examples. Metallica and I think Black Sabbath have brought it out just to have that kind of devilish tone to it, probably. Wherever I May Roam by Metallica and also Inner Sandman used this very rare mode. The band Stroke put out a song called Juicy Juice. 
This instructor on YouTube discusses why you can never feel at home with Locrian mode. This is Locrian. There's a reason why we don't use Locrian. If you really tried to stick with Locrian, you would never feel at home. Just, it sounds very off-putting and to some even evil. At any rate, they're aware of what was figured out in the past during the time of Pythagoras and others from the pages of history, and they know that songs have been used not just for a general sense of emotion, but for very specific usages. This stuff is proving, even in modern times, to be very powerful, to have specific neural effects, and to literally aid in actual mind control. So don't take it for granted. <laughs> 